If it's hotter than a coronal mass ejection, then it must be time for the Mythwits. The show dedicated to all things geek and pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring you on industry guests to talk about the ever-expanding Geekiverse and to play a game with us. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Mike Afis, and I'm joined this week by my co-host, Peter Bryant. And our guest this week is Fraser Kane of Astronomy Cast and Universe Today. Fraser is a publisher of Universe Today and a co-host of Astronomy Cast with his friend and our show friend of the show, Pamela Gay, and creator of Guide to Space video series. The uh, uh, I'm sorry, creator of The Guide to Space, a video series on YouTube. He is also the author of Universe Today: Ultimate Guide to Viewing the Cosmos. Everything you need to know to become an amateur astronomer, as well, friends of the show, as some also industry RPG source materials. He has written books uh, for games such as GURPS, Earth Dawn, and Shadowrun. We did talk about that in our uh, show when we had uh, Fraser on last last. It was about last year, uh, so go definitely check that out. But um for today welcome fraser and thank you for joining us i have returned i bring news of the parker solar probe oh we definitely i have been wanting to do this uh pete was talking about oh you know you're gonna be driving the show mike you've got to come up with topics and i'm like all right uh you know i have my passion and uh i thought oh my gosh when i thought of um what we could talk about and how it would tie in perfectly with the probe getting basically just reaching the sun on its first, was that heliocentric orbit, mm -hmm. um, its mm -hmm. first pass by. Uh, I thought this would be a great time to just uh, kind of cross pollinate and educate some of our viewers about uh, what this mission is, what the technology is involved with it. And I thought there was no one else that I wanted to have on other than the Fraser Kane. Uh, hey, Mike, I'm, uh, Mike, yes. I'm honored that, to be here. Does that make us like the bee of knowledge? We're going to pollinate and educate. <laughs> yes, that is exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> <All right>, fantastic. <laughs> so let's start off first um, by talking about this is uh, what about eighty or so years in the making, sixty to eighty years in the making with uh, right. Well, well, with uh, a particular gentleman, uh, Eugene Parker, correct? Yeah. So I mean, the the history of the Parker Solar Probe, or the name of the Parker Solar Probe, goes back to, as you said, to Parker, and he had um, he had proposed this sort of uh, models about the way the outer atmosphere of the sun works, and had spent a long time trying to convince people that his ideas were were solid, <clears throat> and. Uh, and then over time, uh, it was more and more accepted and became the mainstream. And the interesting thing about the Parker Solar Probe, this is, I think, the first NASA spacecraft that's been named after a person who is uh, still alive. That is correct. Yep. So, um, so while James Webb and the Hubble Space Telescope and, and Chandra and all of these different observatories are all named after Kepler, um, uh, they're all named after these uh, these famous astronomers who are no longer with us. Parker it, was there for the launch, there to talk about the the spacecraft, and I really hope gets a chance to see the first results of the of the science as the Parker Solar Probe does its does its part. Yeah, yeah. that's gonna be that's, cool. that's gonna be awesome. So. I Let's, wait, wait, hold on. That, oh, that's go that, that's got to be a real honor. You know, I mean, think about it. Like, almost nobody gets this. Almost nobody gets some kind of like really cool sciency thing or or some kind of monument or whatever to them while they're still. Like, he gets to see this. Nobody gets to see this. This is awesome. Yep. And, yep. and hey, yep. hey, while we're at talking about dead or alive, let, let's let's raise our glass. Oh. Stan Lee, brother. Oh, yeah. Thank you, buddy. Ninety. Thank you, man. Ninety-five. Totally. Thank you. It's gonna be, it's gonna be really sad to see Marvel movies and to not see that cameo in there. I heard they filmed hear, a bunch yep. of cameos ahead of time, and that we will still see them because they filmed a whole bunch of them ahead of time, oh. just like like generic ones and stuff. So it yeah. might be kind of cool. We might get to see, uh, might get to see Grandpa Lee. I think there's yeah. enough footage of him. They can they can uh, blue screen yeah. that in. Yeah, at a certain point they'll be able to make a deep fake, and they'll be able to have yes. Stanley appear in whatever they want. 
Ah, uh, dude, forever. they they could do like a really cool deep fake and like make him a superhero who like yeah. you know does something really cool. That'd be awesome. I love but that. anyway, anyway, sorry, sorry. I I just wanted to give the man a, a, no. know, a shout out because because we've no, talked Pete. about his properties on our show so many times. It just it wouldn't seem right not to do it. No, thank thank you for pointing that out. I actually had meant to, but thank you for uh, putting that up front. Uh, Frazier, what do we know about the sun so far? I mean, it's hot. It's, it's got a lot. It's full of gas. So, yeah. so far, I mean, we're talking about Pete. Um, yeah. and it's, it's high pressure. I mean, it's like it's, yeah. it's many explosions happening, like all, the, the billions. Well, the, and, I mean, we know lots and lots about the sun. I think the part that's, that's, the part that's really interesting, I mean, we, you know, we know that it's made of, of hydrogen and helium uh, left over from the Big Bang, that the pressure and temperature inside the sun is so great that that molecules of hydrogen are smushed together into helium and that process release, releases energy and it's the outward, it's the energy that comes out of this, like all the photons bouncing around inside the sun push against the gravitational force that's pulling the sun in on itself and it reaches this equilibrium and that's why the sun is the size that it is if the sun was putting out more energy in its core it would be bigger and if it was putting out less it would be smaller and and so those are all fairly well known concepts uh you know in the interior of the sun you've got the core and that's where the fusion is happening then surrounding that is the radiative zone where the uh, the the photons that are generative gamma radiation in the center of the sun, they have to bounce around from, from atom to atom to get absorbed and then re-emitted in, in this random walk. And it'll take an individual photon hundreds of thousands of years to start at the core, actually make it out to the surface. And then outside of the radiative zone, you've got the convective zone. And that's where blobs of uh, heated plasma sort of rise and fall as they pick up heat and then release the heat out into space. And then the part that we can see, the surface of the sun, the photosphere, uh, is where the photons, those photons that did that random walk, can finally make their way out into space. And then they, then it only takes them eight minutes to get to the Earth. But the part that's the real mystery is that as you keep going outside of the sun, you reach another part. And so say the surface of the sun is uh, like 5,000, I forget, 5,300-ish, 5,800 Kelvin, like a lot. Um, but as you get outside of the, of the surface of the sun, you reach the atmosphere of the sun. And strangely, the atmosphere heats back up again to you know more than a million kelvin um mm. and so this is a gigantic mystery to to scientists which is like what could possibly be causing like how can something be hot on the surface and then get a lot hotter out in space far away from the surface of the sun so this is the coronal mystery coronal heating mystery and this is one of the big questions that the parker solar probe is has been designed to try and get to the bottom of now we'll we'll talk a little bit about the sensor systems, but um, it's basically <clears throat> one of the main functions is it's going to be measuring the ionization and uh, well, oh gosh, correct me if I'm wrong, ionization and something else of uh, of of the um, molecules that are kind of come you know protruding off of it. What's going on? And uh oh, did we lose something? Yeah, yeah. Keep going. I'm sorry. Okay. Facebook, Facebook's re look. Hey, folks, if you're watching and, and Facebook is doing something weird, it is doing some really weird, crazy, goofy stuff tonight. Just hang on there. The stream's back. Okay. Or whatever. And we're we're it's we record we're recording um local anyway, so we'll yeah, definitely get it it's, out. It's just being bizarre. Okay. <laughs> yep. You get what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> um. So let's see. Uh, so we're measuring those molecules, or measuring the uh, the, the the particles and their the ionization. And uh, is there a difference in the amount of ions and or the ionization? That I, I remember there's like a double ionization of is it the helium or something as it's coming out or coming off versus the, what's in the coronasphere? I have no idea what you're talking about. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I was getting some stuff off a of video. I thought I'd throw some terms at you, and you'd be like picking up. So uh, hey, I'm just going to throw some science, and you pick it up. <laughs> hey, I, you, I would highly recommend that you talk to a, a solar physicist at some point, go, um, right. and they would be glad to spit those terms. I am the generalist. I am the uh, I'm the person who talks about uh, um, uh, you know who reports on all the missions simultaneously. So 
Um, but but the like something something maybe it's magic we don't know <laughs> is is sort of crossing this gap from the surface of the sun and it is heating the corona back up again right and then somehow this mechanism is is essentially accelerating these particles that are on the you know held in the atmosphere around the sun and it's blasting them out into space and this is this idea that we call the the solar wind so you know that is the main that's the main objective that the parker solar probe is is looking to do and there's a bunch of these there's a bunch of ideas that astronomers have you know, have considered um, that there are like acoustic waves that are moving through the corona of the sun. They are, the, and as they are bunching up, they are sort of concentrating the heat and heating the whole thing up. That there are these magnetic reconnection events where like, you know, the sun is, is like a great big magnet and you've got these magnetic uh, field lines that are passing around the sun and these things can get kind of twisted up. And we, you know, you can see where the magnetic field lines are passing in and out of the sun where the, the sunspots are. So you get a sunspot, they come in pairs because you've got this magnetic field line that's going from, from one sunspot to the other. And so these field lines can kind of get, can get sort of torqued up and then they can snap and, they, and then you get this reconfiguration of the magnetic field lines and this energy can get released out into the atmosphere. And sort of this is another thought on, on the model that's, that's going on. So Parker Solar Probe to the to the rescue. Uh, hey, you know. Fraser, could this be like? I mean, could this? I'm just wondering, could this be something that has to do with like extreme gravity and pressure and just like things that kind of um, we haven't been able to really observe because because we don't have a probe right there. Uh, we haven't been able to observe these sort of phenomena at these scale. Um, and maybe we'll find something in there like, oh wow, when you get this much mass in one place and this much energy. This is what you see. Well, I mean, suns do this, and it is at this point it is a, it's just, it's a resolution idea that we have ideas about Jupiter and ideas about Pluto and I, ideas about Saturn and its moons and all these kinds of things. And the way you get your ideas confirmed is you get really really close and you look <laughs> really you know with a spacecraft. And so the sun is 150 million kilometers away on average from the earth. So it's bright and it's putting out a lot of energy, but it is still actually pretty far away. 150 million kilometers is not close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, the Parker solar probe is going to get within, oh, like oh, they always talk it in, in terms of miles, but it's going to be um, 4.3 million miles away from uh from the uh from the sun at its closest point so it's just going to be close and so it's going to be able to use all of these the suite of instruments including telescope and and camera systems and you know magnetometers and things are going to be able to detest the, the the amount of particles that are coming at it and it's going to be able to make this really close observation of the sun to allow them with high resolution to to be able to see everything it's it's the same thing as like you know having the lunar reconnaissance orbiter orbiting around the moon you know people always wonder why we can't see the uh the 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 apollo landing sites from earth well because you need to get close right can't even see with the hubble space telescope but you send a spacecraft that's only in some cases a couple of hundred kilometers above the surface of the moon and it can absolutely see the footprints and the flags and the mm. and the cars parked on the moon all of that so um it's the, it's really it's the same thing get close bring all your instruments to bear and and measure everything that you possibly can the you know the challenge with the parker solar probe i mean there's two great challenges the first challenge is the fact that the sun is actually the hardest place in the entire solar system to get to so we always think about this idea like all you you know if you want to go to the sun all you have to do is just fall into the sun right, just go right, right to it <laughs> just go to the sun a giant right gravitic there. magnet the, you know it is the, yeah it worked for icarus <laughs> it's the it's the gravitational center of this entire solar system so it should be really easy to get to but the problem is is that we are orbiting on the earth and the earth is going at 30 kilometers per second 
around the sun in its orbit. The closer you get, the faster you get, the, the, the farther you get, the slower you get. But here on Earth, we're going 30 kilometers per second. And so when you think about a rocket that is launching off into space and going into orbit around the Earth, it needs to go about eight and a half kilometers per second to get into orbit. So you need to go about four times as fast to cancel out the Earth's orbit. So first, you know, step one, get into orbit. Step two, cancel the Earth's orbit. And then you can go to the sun. And, and that is a, sort of an incomprehensible amount of, of, of energy. And that's why the, uh, the Atlas rocket that launched the Parker Solar Probe was absolutely beefed up, had rockets on top of rockets on top of rockets to, <laughs> with this tiny little payload, to get it going as fast as possible. It was, it was, I think it was the fastest launched vehicle that's ever been sent off the Earth yeah. because the sun is the hardest place to get to. Uh, so that's the first challenge. And so the way they've solved this is they're using Venus as a gravitational slingshot to be able mm. to get them close to the sun. And we've talked about <laughs> gravitational slingshots in 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 terms of the Voyager spacecraft and the and New Horizons. And so they can use the, gravi the gravity or they can use the orbital momentum of the, the planets that are going out, you know, they're in the outer solar system to get a speed boost. And for people who are kind of wondering how gravitational slingshots work, you know, you sort of imagine yourself falling into the gravity well of Jupiter and it's like you're going down a hill and then you go out the other side of the gravity well and you're going up a hill but in your mind, you sort of imagine they balance out. So how do you get any speed from this, right? You, you mm -hmm. fall down into the gravity well and you fall back up from the gravity well. Well, what you're doing, that, that absolutely happens. You're balancing out, you're, you're falling in and you're going away speed. But what you do is as you're moving towards Jupiter and you get, you, you get caught by Jupiter's gravity well, it starts to pull you towards up to its orbital velocity around the sun. And so what you're doing is you're stealing a little bit mm. of Jupiter's orbital velocity and it is transferring it to you. And so, you know, when, when we send uh, the Voyager spacecraft in New Horizons, they are stealing energy from Jupiter. Jupiter is then is giving them an enormous speed boost. Well, it turns out you can do that in reverse. Mm -hmm. So you can go and you can actually give. And so the Parker Solar Probe is giving orbital velocity to Venus in exchange for being able to get sort of pushed into a new orbit that takes it closer and closer to the sun. And over the course of seven orbits, seven flybys <clears throat> and many orbits around the sun, it's going to get closer and closer and closer until it gets into this final, its final position. Now, so that's challenge number one. Cor correct me if I'm wrong, but I also heard that when we usually think about slingshots is like we're talking about gaining velocity. But in this case, we're using Venus. And instead of going around the outside of Venus, we're going to the inside so that we, as you were saying, we want to slow down yeah. because that's going to change our orbit and bring us closer to the sun. Right. So you can, I mean, you can use a plan, a gravity well to kind of, to slingshot around it. And you can use a gravity well to, to either gain speed or lose speed depending on the direction that you go and so in this case parker solar probe is going in the in the lose velocity give it give velocity to venus and be able to change its trajectory in a way it's going to do this again and again and again until it's until it's in the final orbit that it wants to be and so that was like i said there's two challenges two great challenges that was the first one and the second great challenge is to have your spacecraft not die when it is that close to the sun. And so the way they're dealing with this is, is Parker Solar Probe has this very thick um, carbon fiber uh, heat shield that is on one face of it. And as the spacecraft is, is at the perihelion, as it's sort of passing the closest point of its orbit around the sun, it sort of points... It brings its heat shield up, it sort of turns itself, keeps the heat shield in between it and the, and the sun and absorbs all of that heat while it's making a bunch of these observations. And then it goes out into a, a farther orbit, cools down, um, and then comes back around for another, for another look. And it is a, it's a great technology for it to be able to protect itself from just the ridiculous radiation and heat that's going on. So, wait a minute. So, Mike, hold on. I got two. I got two. Two comments on that. 
Um, the first one is is that we've talked about this on the show before about getting rid of heat. That that a lot of people don't realize that even though space is super super cold, uh, there's no medium for you to expel heat into, or very little medium that uh, there is. Um, so it's very hard for spaceships to actually get rid of heat. They like the the satellites that are up there now, like the the space station. You know, it has these big long um, arrays out that that are actually to get rid of heat. And so I was wondering is that has got to be a major uh, obstacle for this thing, That, that uh, a major piece of science that they, they've they science the crap out of this. It's a major technology yeah. that they've done to be able to get this thing so close and it suck. It's like all oh, this heat generated on it. And then it's able to, it's going to be able to, to, to displace some of this heat. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, so um, it is getting 475 times the amount of solar energy at the perihelion than what we get here on earth. Oh. So 475 times the solar radiation, which is just ludicrous. Did they pack sunblock? What's that? <laughs> did, did they pack sunblock? <laughs> yeah. yeah no. well, I think, well, yeah, yeah. You, you, we should all use sunblock, which is several inches of yeah. heat field. You know, it's that 11. Yeah. <laughs> All of it. SPF it's, infinity. It's amazing. This carbon foam and carbon um, panel system is eleven centimeters. Yeah, it's eleven centimeters, that's and it. that is that. That's what's protecting and billions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not uh, hundreds uh, of millions. Uh, yeah. It was yeah. Well, I, the whole program. I think was a billion and a half billion. to get it where yeah. it is. Oh, is it okay? Yeah. Well, that's no. That's the whole thing. That that's getting it into space and everything and all that. Yeah. But the we'll little the little probe they could. Um, but the other the other thing I wanted to mention was is that uh, this really reminds me. It's one of those movies that I really like. I know it's I know it has inaccuracies, and I know it's a little goofy at the end. But the movie Sunshine mm -hmm. is is really touches on the whole uh, uh, the heat shielding and everything. There's a whole thing on that. Um, it's a good movie. I like the movie. I I, I don't know. I don't. Do you like the movie? It was fine. It, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was mostly good. There was a lot of really good sciencey stuff, and then there was. Eh, I mean, yeah. All right. So I, I was looking at um, some some numbers here, and it said the temperatures that the solar probe is going to be experiencing, even being the what, what did you say, forty million, four hundred million miles away, four, four, four million. million, four million miles away. Yeah. And the sun itself is a million miles across. Right. So that gives you some some Ooh. perspective. <laughs> oh, we close. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, it's going to be experiencing anywhere from 300 degrees Celsius to 1300 degrees Celsius. Now, I didn't really know what that means, so I asked Google, and uh, she told me that uh, that is between 572 degrees Fahrenheit to, get ready, 2372 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, thanks to our logarithmic. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think system. you are at the limits of essentially material science at the mm -hmm. closest point those kinds of temperatures which which begged the question and i had to do a little bit of research on this and i thought wow um copper wire that's uh that, that ain't gonna cut it no. and uh it's niobium they use a niobium uh composition of wiring for all the circuitry um uh, on on the and it can handle the heat yeah that's crazy yeah so it's just like what is the what is the closest you can get? What is the amount of solar radiation that's coming at it? How how long can you make the heat shield protect the spacecraft? And then it's just a balance to just play all those things together to make it do its job. It's a it's a stunning, I mean, accomplishment. And I cannot wait. Because again, right? Imagine we are gonna see, we have seen pictures of the sun. All of the spacecraft that, that you know of, the solar dynamic observatory, the these are all still roughly our orbit. So mm -hmm. the Hino Day, the they're all around 150 million kilometers, while this one's going to be, say, I don't know, 6 million kilometers. So it's just a better close-up picture. I cannot wait to see the the images and data that are going to come out of this mission. Yeah, you know what's going to be cool is take one of these videos and like put it on your TV like and, and just put it like on a loop. Yeah. So you're just <laughs> staring into yeah. the heart of the like, sun. That's and then awesome. put like a soundtrack of like logs on a fire at the same yeah. time. Yeah. So yes. it, you know, it just sounds like crap. <laughs> I don't know. Wouldn't, wouldn't nuclear explosions be more appropriate? Maybe, though? yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. you know, I, think, I, you know I, people have that, fi that fire, they, 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 that Yule log yeah. they set up on you yeah. know, Christmas time. I just think like run that instead. 
That'd be awesome. Yeah, exactly. And get out your, you know, get out your uh, your yeah. chair, your your uh, fold out lawn chair, you know, and, and and your shorts, and put your little strip across yeah. your nose, get your yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little like an eighty inch television, just yeah. bask awesome. in the heat. That'd be awesome. nice. Awesome. Oh man. So uh, let me see. Do you know anything about the propulsion systems that that it's using for? There is um stuff that it's using for. Um, they're calling them um, trajectory correction maneuvers, which is, I think there's some sort of a heat. They actually have a fuel tank of helium fuel on board that they'll use to, to adjust do, do, do those maneuvers. But there's also something that I was looking into and I, I couldn't, I didn't know if you know anything about momentum reaction wheels or the electromotor force with how it's using it to, to tweak. Cause the thing is off center because of the way that it shipped and shaped and the way that it has the, um, the the one Faraday array that's measuring a lot of the ionization. Yeah. They were saying that it's it's got uh, it it gets like starts to twist and, and in in order for it to, to go back it, it has like some yeah weird... so so this is um so this is the idea of of there's actually two things two spinny wheels that happen on spacecraft there's the gyroscopes and there's the reaction wheels mm -hmm. and so the reaction wheels are are wheels that spin and they can run them in three different dimensions. And so think about when um, uh, you're, uh, I don't know, like you're sitting on a chair and you hold a bicycle wheel that's spinning in your hand. You've got like some little yeah. handle mm -hmm. and you're holding it. Have you ever done this experiment? Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes. You turn the thing one way and you turn as a reaction to the spinning that's happening from the wheel. And then you turn the thing the other way and you spin the other way on, on your chair or whatever, because you're essentially experiencing the reverse momentum from, from the wheel. And so all modern spacecraft use these, these ideas of reaction wheels. They have them in three dimensions and, and they spin in one direction and the spacecraft spins in the other way thanks to you know, equal and opposite reaction, right? And that's mm -hmm. why they're called reaction wheels. And uh, this is what killed Kepler. So the Kepler, NASA's Kepler spacecraft, it had reaction wheels and its reaction wheels, uh, it lost two of its reaction wheels. And without that, it wasn't able to direct itself anymore. Oh, okay. uh, they came up with a super clever way to solve this problem. They, uh, uh, they realized that the sunlight, the, the light pressure coming from the sun, they could, they could balance the spacecraft perfectly so that the light kept it perfectly balanced. And so it was really the sunlight from the sun was keeping the spacecraft pointing at its target. Hmm. Hmm. Astonished ability. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, and then the other thing that they have are called gyros. And the gyros are to stabilize. So uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is equipped with gyros and reaction wheels, but the gyros are the ones that it really needs and the ones that you probably heard in the news that Hubble lost one of its gyroscopes. And so for Hubble to be able to point at the exact same position for, for hours, days, weeks, it needs to have these really um, stable gyroscopes that just, you know, they, they make it resist any slight movements. And, uh, and when the gyros go, then Hubble is, is no longer good at pointing it at direction. So, so uh, all spacecraft pretty much now, if they, because you don't want to use thrusters to, to point your spacecraft, that, that uses propellant and you only have a certain amount of that. Mm -hmm. You want to use reaction wheels because you can run those electricity. You can run them forever. Um, the James Webb space telescope has um, optical light, uh, laser based uh, reaction or la laser based gyroscope. I don't even know how this works yet. I'm, I'm still sort of looking into this idea, but apparently no laser? moving parts. It uses lasers instead, which just sounds <laughs> awesome. But, uh, but yeah, so you, you know, always, and, and this is the joke that we always make is that, that spacecraft die because they didn't have enough reaction wheels and gyroscopes. And so, you know, I just want to see, well, have, however many reaction wheels you think you need, add double. <laughs> Don't be surprised hey. if we hear James uh, solar probe dies because it's reaction wheels broke. Hey, Fraser, in my industry, we do prototypes. Two is one and one is none. Yeah, there you go. So, so, so twelve is, would be nice. Pete, yeah. Uh, has anyone in the chat room uh, been throwing up any questions? 
I answered one for Paul, but uh... in fact, they have. All right, so Spence had a question, and this is this is more of a general question. Um, so anyone could chime in on this one. Uh, if it were possible, in other words, if we had the infrastructure for it, would construction of these probes be easier in space? Let's say we had a little space factory floating around the Earth. Would it be easier to, say, build this, uh, this and send it off from there? Uh, today or in the future? So, I mean, right now, right now, right, no. now, right. Yeah, right now, no, <laughs> so uh, we have no real proper space infrastructure. Uh, the only thing that can build things in space right now is this really cool 3D printer that's on the International Space Station yes. made by Made in Space. And they're able to produce little wrenches and and they're moving to a point where they're going to start making more space based stuff. Uh, but the company behind it, a company called Made in Space, has got plans for their next gadget uh they're called they call it the arconaut and it is a it is a three-armed space spider is the way i sort of describe it where it has hoppers of material inside of it and then it spins out girders from an orifice and it uses these three nice. arms to grab these things and then maneuver them into place and bolt them together. And then it, <sighs> you know, it sort of extrudes another one and then wow. it bolts it together. It's like and a clown it, blowing balloons, you know? Like, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. like, like I imagine it's a space spider, and that's that's what I'm going with. And so it's going to be able to to build structures in space. It's going to be able to build. Um, you know, you can imagine it building uh, space stations and and giant space telescopes and oh, and awesome. kind of what orbital colonies and whatever you need. Just one, just as long as you keep its hoppers filled up, it'll just keep extruding new girders for you, hmm. space girders. So, and, so, so we're at this point where where we're starting to move into this into really testing out how feasible it is to construct things in space. The next thing you want to do is you want to get your resources from space, asteroids, the moon. You know, once you're already out in a gravity well, it makes a ton more sense to remain out in space. Don't try to bring stuff up from the surface of the Earth. Stay out in space. Take an asteroid, dismantle it, and there's plans from a bunch of companies to be able to start mining stuff from asteroids. So all the pieces that will come together to be able to do this is is getting there uh you're absolutely right you're already in orbit so to be able to then send a spacecraft to you know to some other destination becomes significantly easier the trick is of course building a very complicated and sensitive and delicate instrument like a space probe it's going to require a you know a certain amount of just human hands-on uh, manufacturing today, but you can definitely imagine, say, 20, 30 years from now, you're going to have auto factories in space that are able to take various materials as a hopper in, and then maybe you still have to launch up the circuit board, or maybe you have to still launch up some of now, the we'll print those. components. But we'll print those! Yeah, you'll print that too. Who knows what it's going to be, right? Yeah. So, and who knows what's even possible to pr print in, in three dimensions in space where you don't have gravity. So, Look, so it is one of the I, most, I think people, sorry, just people don't realize how far this technology is along and how all, you're going to see all this stuff come together in stunning speed over the next decade, I would say. I want to, I want to, so I want to comment on the 3D printing because, because we do that. And uh, one of the things that, that it never occurred, I never thought about it. I never put one ounce of thought into printing something in space and the differences it would make until just now when we were talking. And it's, a, it's, it's completely different. It's a completely different process. I mean, well, maybe the same process, but there's so many different factors because gravity is a pain in the ass when you're printing 3D and you have to print these things called support structures because it prints layers, right? Yep. So if you have yep. something that's that's this big around, oops, sorry, so my camera this big around and then you want to print something on top of it that's this big around, you have to print support structure underneath of it. Well, guess what? When there's no gravity, you don't have to do any of that. Yep. And you could print in multiple directions at a time. Mm -hmm. You could print yep. this way or this way or off in this angle and if you had the right kind of head, you could do them all kind of at once. Yeah. Uh, it's so, so 3D printing in space actually would be easier and yeah. you would have way more options I, you know i want to shamelessly self-promote of uh, my videos but on a recent yeah, video i did i <laughs> went all into the different kinds of manufacturing in space that's that's that people are working on and there's some really great i mean not just i mean people have developed have absolutely cracked 
various kinds of plastics, but there's some really interesting forms of concrete and other kinds of, of metal. They've figured out sintering in space to be able to generate metallic objects. They've, uh, with with a certain amount of, I forget what it's like, magnesium oxide or something like that, they can make some pretty interesting uh, structures as well. So so again, uh, a lot of the thinking has gone into this and and now it's just a matter of letting all of these various technologies start to play out in, in space. And when you look at the cost of launching coming down, 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 um, we're going to start to see more and more stuff get sent up into space and to start dismantling the solar system for, for our future O'Neill cylinders. God, I, just, I, I want to live to be 200 just so I can see I some of this stuff. No. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Don't go to space no. if that's what you want to do then because no. that place is terrible. Oh, no, I don't want to go to space. I just no. want to see all the stuff that other people yeah. do in space. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely encourage you to go check out uh, Fraser's Guide to Space uh, series because it's uh, it's so wonderful. Uh, I watched a little bit about you when you were talking about the solar, uh, the Parker probe as well. Um, and one of the things that I learned uh, is that <clears throat> when you suggest a video game that I should not listen to you anymore because you t <laughs> you recommended Kerbel Space Program and – I, I have been playing that, and mm. it's, it's like so amazing, really. It's so yeah. amazing. It, I have, and you are absolutely right. He said, folks, if you want to learn more about what it takes to get something built on the ground, up into space, and to somewhere else, and it's a long process, <laughs> yeah. uh, go check out that program. Because yeah, really, the, the joke that I always make is I've learned more about – it's not really a joke. I've learned more about space flight – from the Kerbal Space Program than almost 20 years of being a space journalist. Like, nice. like this, it's when you're launching rockets and when you're doing orbital insertion maneuvers and when yeah. you're attempting to do uh, gravitational slingshots and, and, uh, and docking and things like that and, and touch, you know, and, and landing gently on the moon um, as opposed to uh, lithobraking is when you deeply understand how this whole space flight thing works. And it has totally changed my understanding of, of the way space flight works. So yeah, I highly recommend a uh, Kerbal space program. Fun, fun nice. game. Peter. Yes. yes. Hold on. Uh, Let me, any remarkable so, questions before we move on, because we are running late. So we do yeah, need we to late. move on. Okay. So, so I'm going to say, let, let's do this real quick. Okay. So not going to use, uh, Paul Noon says uh, not going to use dense atmosphere of Venus for aero braking. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna throw this out there and say, that sounds really dangerous to our little probe. I think gravity is less no. a, a, yeah, yeah, probably not a good idea, right? Too much friction. No, and such. don't get. I mean, if, unless you want to land on Venus. I mean, the yeah. the hilarious thing, Venus is like probably the easiest planet in the entire solar system to land on. Um, because the atmosphere is so dense that you can re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, you slow down, and then you just uh, slowly sort of blob down to the surface of, of Venus. Now, of course, and then Venus you is melt a, the death. Then you yeah, completely melt. Venus is a horrible <laughs> deathscape, but landing on Venus Worst is a piece of cake. Place. But but you don't. But that atmosphere will grab you and keep you. So you don't want to go anywhere near it. Um, right. No, Tell you just want to use the gravitational apart. slingshot. Yeah. Uh, All and right. Then, so wait, wait, wait. One more. One more. One more. One more. All right. Uh, one more. Let me. Let me see. Uh, I know I saw it on here. Hold on. Um, uh, no, we're gonna skip that one. Uh, no, we're gonna skip that. That's not a good question. Sorry, Paul. Uh, all right. So okay. So are we gonna see the space elevator in the next hundred years? And I don't know. That's a hard question to answer. Okay, because because there are more than one problem. There are scientists in China right now who are bragging about having a material that's strong enough for the cable, which is like way stronger than carbon nanotubes. Like I think I remember the last time I was reading this, we take a standard carbon nanotube and it still needs to be like 180 times stronger or something like that, something ridiculously stronger. And yeah. there's some scientists in China that's claiming that they have it, they've solved it, but we've heard Ruby. this line before. Yeah. But but that's not the biggest problem. Uh, we talked to, when we were talking to Pamela. Really, I coming think it up was. with a material structure that that doesn't exist right now and crafting a length of it that's forty thousand kilometers <laughs> long isn't the big problem. Okay. Well, no, it is. No, it is a big problem. It's a humongous problem. But I think maybe, maybe. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me, tell me what you think. But Pamela had mentioned something that I had never thought of before, 
was all that space junk up there. Mm -hmm. We'd have to clean all that shit up. And yeah, that it's going to slice not... the dice. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that is no um, minor task. <laughs> yeah. The, but here's the funny thing is when the SpaceX BFR gets flying, the, the big freaking rocket, the big fabulous rocket, the big mm -hmm. uh, Falcon rocket, um, the, the cost per launch will rival what a space elevator will do. So we are two Ooh, years away really? from a launch system that is, that is as cost effective as a space elevator. Get out of here, really? Yeah, yeah. So, <gasps> so forget space elevators. Hey, you know what, hey, correct me if I'm wrong, Fraser. Space elevator, I always thought space elevator would be really good for like the moon or maybe Mars. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely have the technology. We have to have the materials that would make a space, space elevator work on the moon and probably Mars. The moon is the place to go. The moon is the place yeah. to set up a space elevator for sure. Although, um, well, because, I mean, the, the trick was with the BFR, it can pull its fuel right out of the air, right? Hmm. It can use a, a, a factory that will pull, will make methane out of carbon dioxide water and sunlight here on wow. earth and then refill itself and then away it goes but wow. it's not going to be able to huh. easily make fuel on the surface of the moon right. yeah, that's got to be a whole new show right there we we need to have you back just to talk about hey, that you haven't talked about the bfr yet i mean the bfr <laughs> oh, so it, like there's a big announcement that came on the bfr just on friday um uh, musk announced they're going to create a, a a mini bfr that's going to ride on top of a falcon 9 rocket so uh no we are the bfr is is you know according to musk going to be doing hop tests next year so hmm. it's going to start like hopping around like the like the their original um grasshopper dragonfly dragonfly what was it called yeah dragon anyway the, their first yeah the first that first prototype rocket that they did it's going to do that but at a enormous scale and then um by the 2020, I think, so two years from now, uh, the, the full stack is going to be going into orbit, and they're going to be attempting to land both top and bottom stage back on Earth. And if you pull that off, it is, the, it, is, it is the cheapest rocket that's ever been built, right? It'll be the cheapest rocket to ever operate and the most powerful rocket that's, that's uh, ever been built. <laughs> So it'll be both of those things simultaneously, <laughs> which awesome. again is a mind-bending so, concept. So, so all great. right, so Peter, great. we're in the future, man. We're in the future, and and yet we're running late. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> so uh, sorry. Let's uh, let let. Oh man, I'll tell you let's what. Um, wrap it up. So so Fraser, we we got to have you back, man. Like I, I had all this stuff listed out to talk about other stuff, and I mean. Uh, Pete can just go and blab on and on and on about all kinds of stuff. He loves it. And, and I can too. I mean, this is all, all this stuff is fascinating. We have got to just talk. We'll have more. I mean, you are definitely going to be our, um, our, our, um, spaceship expert, our space, uh, go guy. If, if you'll have us back, <laughs> if you'll, if you'll let us have you back, <laughs> let, let, let me, well, yeah, let's pick some, uh, some exciting accomplishments and, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to come back and, and chat. Awesome. But awesome. Obviously, awesome. there's so many cool things going on that it's sort of hard to stay focused on on the Parker yeah. Solar Probe alone. Right. But, right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, all right. Well, I will save my questions. You know what? We will have you back, and I will save a couple of my questions. It's not like the the Parker Probe is going anywhere. <laughs> nope. Well, it you is. Know? It's actually going to get <laughs> yeah. going closer places. And closer and closer yeah. to the sun. It's right. just going to get better and better. We have right. seven years. <laughs> seven, seven years to prepare. Right. That's right. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, why don't we get the get going on this game there? Hey, wait, give out links. Oh, oh, you know what? Before we uh, before we do that, actually, why don't you tell us a little bit about your book? Because sure. I, I don't want to have uh, us rushing around at the end and have us uh, not able to yes. talk about it. No problem. That's why. That's really why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, so we have just released on October twenty third. Uh, the Universe Today uh, Ultimate Guide to Viewing the Cosmos, nice. uh, written by uh, by our uh, our amateur astronomy beat uh, reporter uh, Dave Dickinson, and uh, with additional information from me oh. and uh, forward by Dr. Pamela Gay, of course, my co-host on Astronomy Cast. And the part for the people who are looking, I hope you can kind of sort of see and appreciate the beautiful photography oh, that's in the yeah. book. 
the and this is the part that I'm really proudest of. I mean, all the all the words that Dave wrote were great, and he did a great, fantastic job. I really loved it. Um, uh, but the part that I think really kind of kicks it over the over the top is that I reached out to um, a bunch of amateur astrophotographers that I know, and they were able to supply pictures for the book that you'll have never seen anywhere else pictures of the milky way and of star trails and meteor showers and rocket launches and things like that and and because i really wanted to i wanted to show people that 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 amateur like you don't need to have the hubble space telescope to be able to to take pictures of the night sky no you know you don't have access to your own hubble space telescope but with patience and gear and skill and practice you can produce just some astonishing photographs photographs of the night sky and so we have a whole section on astrophotography and we really want to get people uh just out there and, and looking up and and starting to to get into this amazing hobby of astronomy so uh, yeah, book is out. Uh, having a great time with it, and uh, if you have already got a copy, or you know, do get a copy, please, please, please write a review because we're in that early stage where mm. where people have to find out about it, and the only way to find out about it is if there's lots of of reviews of the book. So if you have got one, please please write a review. Absolutely. Go to Goodreads, rate of your view, check out um, yeah. Amazon. Amazon. Amazon, yes. Yeah. Uh, I looked up Fraser Kane, F R A S E R K C A I N. I looked him up on uh, Amazon and found his books. And as well, we have role players. Yeah. Uh, that's what we do is we bridge the communities uh, with, with uh, RPGs. So check out uh, some of his other stuff too, his source yeah. books. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, oh, definitely. And, hey, do that's. That is definitely a Christmas list item. That is that is going to be on one of those because that is a be yeah. Fraser. That is a beautiful looking book just from here. It, from so speaking sitting... of playing, imagine it's the Dungeon Master's Guide, but it's space is what it sort of feels nice. like. Nice to the yes. cosmos. <laughs> yes, the Dungeon Master's Guide to the Cosmos is, is really how the book feels. It's it a little shorter DMGC. than the DMG Guide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a little shorter than DM, DMG by about uh, maybe an inch. But apart okay. from that, it uh, it absolutely feels like a it's the abridged like a, copy, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Well, it's All short right. like height, but it has about the same thickness, so it okay. really feels exactly like a uh, like a like a player's handbook or a DMG. Excellent. All right, so Mike, what what are the links, man? What are the links? What you don't have links? We're gonna do your game. All right, let's do the game. That's fine. No, All no, right, no. Right? Just, Okay. No, it's up to you, man. It's your show. <laughs> uh, where there, there's there's just uh, links to Astronomy Cast, uh, AstronomyCast.com, and links to UniverseToday.com. Correct. Okay, that's there you go. UniverseToday.com, AstronomyCast.com. <laughs> All right, fantastic. All right, Mike, here you go. Ready? It's time for the game. Boom. All right. Uh, now I wasn't ready. You had Don't me looking all over the links. Okay. <clears throat> it's game time with the Mythwits. <laughs> I'm Michael Cavis, and I'll be your game master. And this week, we're playing Pop That Instatag, where you will be competing to see who has their finger on the pulse of Instagram. I will give you two hashtags found on Instagram, and you must come closer than your opponent does in estimating the amount of posts containing that hashtag. In order to score more points... And that player with more points, i.e. the lowest error percentage rating, wins. This is very calculating, as it were. So, without any more ado, uh, both of you seem pretty versed. I'm going to say, uh, this is General Primer. Uh, the most used hashtag ever on Instagram is love, hashtag love. And it's about 1,400,800-something million. Yeah. Wow. So th that's it's almost the not most. worth using. It's so flushed out. Yes. So uh, that, that's just a sort of a primer. Now, I, I took some more that we're going to play a little more cerebral, although one of them, you know, there's a couple that are fun. Uh, we're going to see how many we can go with, uh, how many we can get through. So let's see if we can um, <clears throat> plow through. I'm going to go. We're going to start with Frazier, gets the first guess, then Pete, and then we'll alternate. All right. Okay. So Frazier, th I'm gonna, we're doing these in pairs. Okay. So it's to compare and contrast, but you will be guessing for both. The sun, hashtag sun. And hashtag moon. Uh -huh. So, what do you think? How many? Uh, oh, and I'm also being generous. I'm not gonna. Um, 
I'm not going to like just put you totally out there. I'm giving you a scale. Okay, so it's somewhere between the the answer lies somewhere. The correct answer lies somewhere between 10 million and 450 million. Okay, uh, of how many hashtags include sun and how many include moon? Okay. So, uh, so you, want, you want separate numbers for both of those? Yes, correct. Okay, I see. All right. Um, so they're both a hundred million. You're going to go with a, a solid hundred million a solid for both. Hundred million for both of them. All right. And Peter. Hmm. Huh. Okay. So I know Instagram really, really plays on. Uh, artsy types and, and it's not the it's not the it's not the place not that there's not intellectuals on instagram but i don't think instagram um i don't think instagram courts the intellectual as much as it does the artist not that they're two different people don't don't get me wrong i'm saying predominantly okay so, so no insults here at all but i'm gonna th i think that the that that the the moon gets more only because uh it resonates more with um with with artistic types and such and, and and you know like these people who are spiritual you know like people who go to like uh the what is it that the burning man and stuff so i'm gonna say not the burning man doesn't to the sun but I, well i don't know they worship the sun too shit Whoa. i don't know this is hard okay so mike uh i'm gonna say what were my ranges again <clears throat> i'm sorry my father clock shadow just hit six o'clock um sorry it's uh 10 million to 450 million Somewhere around the, the, the answer lies in between. I'm going to say 5 million for the moon and 1 million for the sun. Okay. 10 million. It's at least above 10 million. <laughs> Cutting you oh. off. What? Right. So you're saying, wait, my range? Less than 10 million. The range is 10 oh, to oh, 450 oh. million. Oh. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood. I'm sorry. It's it's a hard game. It's it's a new yeah. game. I never played this one. It so happens. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say 300 million for the moon and 150 million for the sun. And uh, what was that for the sun? 150 million. 150 million. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Fraser. Actually, for both of you, the sun actually has 207,594,000 hashtags. Nice. Okay. And the moon has 24 million. Oh, I was so wrong. I was so yeah, wrong. You were wrong for all the wrong reasons. All, reasons, all the wrong reasons. All right. <laughs> right. Well, hey. Now, Peter, uh, uh, Frazier, for the sun and the moon, he gets uh, five points for being uh, close. His error is for the uh, moon. He gets five points. You are out of the ballpark at all to get points for the, the for the moon, rather. So you get it for okay. the sun. Uh, you, Peter, uh, were in the 20 percentile for uh, the sun, which means you get eight points. Nice. Wow. And you get nothing for the moon. Oh, now, fantastic. Now, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, the next one it is okay now pete you can go first okay star trek hashtag star trek and hashtag star wars all right dude star wars has got to blow star trek away not that star wars is better that is not what i'm saying not at all okay they're they're as good equally in different right. directions now can but, i can i give you the scale first before you throw me a number okay i will well well okay. but but i think the star war I really think the Star War is mm -hmm. going to beat the Star Trek in, in the Instagrams. So go ahead. Mm -hmm. What's my range? Your range is 1 million to 50 million. 1 million, 50 million. And that's okay. an in between, not an outside. Just right, 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 right. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to say the Star War. The Star War. I, I do that on purpose. Okay. The Star War is uh, 30 million, and the, the Star Trek. Which I don't know if you guys knew this, but the ship is called the Enterprise. It's not called the Star Trek. I'm kidding. Uh, it's uh, ten million. Ten million. Star ten. Trek Enterprise. Yes, yes. I'm just messing with. It. <laughs> you got that, Mike? I do. Okay, uh, Fraser. That was ten million. Yes, and uh, okay, thirty million. Yep. All right. Um, 
Have that at Frasier. Uh, I'm going to put the uh, Star Trek at 6.1 million. Star Trek. Six. And I'm going to put the Star Wars at 28.2 million. Oh, nice. So look at you. You're Give me that very... number one more time. 28.2. 28. Two. <laughs> I love your fucking mind. million. <laughs> One of my things is not filling in the uh, the amount of uh, uh, digits I need, so that's that's a fun thing. Okay. Yeah. Um. So the first one. Needs to be corrected. That's six point one. All right. <laughs> so that's six million, six million one hundred thousand for Star Trek. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, add Peter. That was ten. Ten million and thirty million. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Star Wars is thirty million five hundred sixty thousand. Wow. So That's tight. Peter, you were very tight. You get ten points on that one. Nice. Uh you also where where are you? You are uh, you're eight percent, right? No, you two what you what did you say, Fraser? Twenty eight point two. Yeah, so you're you're within eight percent, so you get an you get uh ten points as well. Damn. Nice. nice. And Star Trek is one million seven hundred eighty-seven thousand? Oh, that is correct. What? So both of you are off the charts. So no points wow. for that. Wow. Hey, I was right about the, the Star Trek. Not as not the, my numbers weren't right, but my my logic was right. Mm-hmm. Instagrammers like the Star War. All right. They so, ain't feeling the Star Trek. So, uh. Pete, what is the score? I think we're going to do one more. I know we're low on time, and I, I yeah, have yeah. more of these, but I can save them um, Dude, it's for the next close. time. It's 15 to 18 at this point. Okay, all right. It's anybody's well, game. A, we definitely have a tiebreaker, but we're definitely going to go one more, and we'll see if uh, Frazier okay. wants to go even further. We can. Not a okay, problem. Right. We've got a little bit of a late start, but uh, we'd like to keep it into an hour. So, All right. <clears throat> Frazier, this next one is kind of in, in honor of Pete. <laughs> Both of them, actually. But... Uh, the first one, hashtag NaNoWriMo. Nice. And the next one, hashtag No Nut November. Oh, God. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, my God. Listen, I mean. It, I it, just found out about this No Nut November. I, like, I saw, I, know, somebody, I saw somebody post it. Like, what the hell is this? And I had to go look it up. I was like, really? Really? First of all, kind of an itchy. You could check out some of the pictures, the postings. It's, some of it is r bizarre but, and, and I, I not very tasteful. <laughs> Some of it is kind of funny, uh, even in, in a higher brow funny. Um, but that said, <laughs> uh, your scale is 90,000 mm -hmm. to 500,000. So, okay. we're, you know, a little bit, we're down down a couple of... Uh... Yeah, we, we, went, we went down a peg on that one. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, not that that makes it any easier or not. I'm not sure. But uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, <laughs> Killing me, Mike. What, what are the grammars like in NaNoWriMo or No Not November? What do you All think? Right, so more... I guess I go first. So I have yeah. no I have, That is a meme that is unfamiliar to me, this No Not November. So, yeah. Uh, For most men in their 40s, it wouldn't be because we have no interest in not um, – Yeah. We we don't play uh, that game. Yeah, we that don't game, play that game. That is that is not a fun game for us. <laughs> yeah, but I but I don't want to like search Instagram to find out because then I will find out the number. Right. Y you don't want to know so that. That's not... So uh, uh, let's just say right. these young kids are, are are thinking, you know, oh, uh, all right, all right. Here, here's the way to explain it. This has got to be a millennial thing. Got to remember be. the remember the episode on on um, Seinfeld where uh, they all had you know. <laughs> King of the yeah. castle. I'm out. <laughs> master your domain. Yeah. yeah right. Being uh, being master of your domain. So my, and my range was nine hundred thousand to no, ninety thousand. Ninety thousand to five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. All right. All right. All right. All right. So I'm going to go with NaNoWriMo, which I have a slight knowledge of. Uh, I'm going to put that at 
a hundred and seventy four thousand. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put no, not November um, around 315,000. 315,000. Excellent. And right. Peter. Mike, you know, I, I, I'm thinking like Fraser. Okay, because, because NaNoWriMo is this great intellectual thing where people are encouraged to write a novel. Right. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It's, it's, it's this thing that uh, helps mankind. Like writing is probably writing and books are probably the, the greatest thing to ever happen to, to society. Right. Mm, and this is true. a this, this is a thing to encourage people to write books. Right. So it's it's it, it's pushing on this the greatness of society of, of what we are. And then. No, not November, which has to do with a basic biological need. So we would think normally it's like, oh, that's the lowbrow thing. But but it's who we biologically are. It's getting to the core of our biology. So it does make sense that that would be the highest of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to say no, not November. Unfortunately, unfortunately, 400,000. 400,000. And and I'm uh -huh. gonna put I'm gonna put NaNoWriMo again, unfortunately, at one hundred thousand. They should be reversed, but they're not, and I'm not gonna believe that they are if you tell me well, they are. I certainly don't want to live in a world where that's the case. Right, but we do. I think we do. Well, I mean, you think look, we do. Look at the current. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, that's what we're about to find out. <laughs> we are okay. about to find out, ladies and gentlemen. Contrary to what you may think. Imagine you two gentlemen are on Instagram. You are a sample size that is, believe it or not, you know, just as important as the millennials and my children, which is scary. But uh, that said, NaNoWriMo, 264,265 as of this afternoon. Wow, nice. Yes. Now, no, not November. 198,927. My, you know what? I'm glad I didn't get any points on that because my faith in humanity is restored. Yeah, yep. we'll check back. <laughs> I'm this glad year I'm wrong. And see, where, <laughs> see where the positions are. NaNoWriMo has been going for years and years and years. Well, I'm sure this, uh, this, this... Uh, new meme is just popping out of nowhere. <laughs> and November's not even over yet. You got another, got another 18 days. So yeah. give it time. Yeah. Oh, so, goodness. all right. So, uh, Frazier, you fared well. Uh, that was a 34th percentile, which gives you uh, seven points for NaNoWriMo. And uh, you were in the 50th percentile, so that's five points for uh, No Not November. Peter, no no points, No Not November, and you are four points. So okay. uh, what is our score? All right. He's got hey, me. You, <clears throat> this is awesome. So, uh, so, so our score is, uh, our low end is Peter Bryant, this guy right here with 22 points and Frazier Kane, hold on, uh, where'd it go? Wait a minute. You got more points yes. than me, brother. Oh, did I? I won right on. You did. Yeah. Where the heck go. is it? Get, can we have the oh, point? Oh, here you go. Sorry, sorry. Here you go. Frazier, you get this. Yes. What Our winner, folks. <laughs> what was his points? His, his points. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. All right. So there you go. Uh, and I have plenty more of these. And uh, you know, Fraser, I, I was going to be decided to be kind. Like, no, no, November was the the lowest hanging fruit we went with, uh, pun intended. Uh, but I had some other ones too. And uh, I'm going to save these for when you guys All get right. back because um, there there's a couple of really uh, it, it's it's fascinating. I lost my own bet, so believe me, I'm not surprised how you guys um, thought, hey, uh, Pete. But uh, I gotta tell you, you, you know what? Uh, well, I, I guess you have to, but it would be it would be fascinating to not give us the limits. Like yeah. I think, like I just love to like blue sky. <laughs> you know? I, I kind of wanted you guys to get some points though. Yeah. <laughs> I like like even within the limits, I made sure that if you went like near the upper limits or lower limits, you know you quite possibly would would score zero points so right yeah. right no i, so I took I, that I, in consideration I'm, i gotta tell you the last question i'm so happy i was so wrong fantastic <laughs> <laughs>
the best. Awesome. Hey, so, hey, what do you, what do you think Mike, of that, though, Pete? Yeah, I like it. I like it's a good game, and I think I okay. think uh, Mike, you brought that in because I'm doing Nanorima, which everybody knows because we mentioned it last mm-hmm. week. But I'm doing good. I am falling behind a little bit, though. I had a I had a thing I was working on this weekend that you helped me with with Aethercon, mm-hmm. which slowed my progress down just a little bit because I online role playing convention. Yeah, I I was assisting on an online role playing convention. Um, so I, I fell behind a little bit, but I need to catch up. I had four mm-hmm. days off of work and I fell behind. How is that a thing? But I did. Uh, but, but I'm okay. I'm not like way behind. I'm only kind of behind, but I'm going to get there. My novel's All coming, right. folks. Coming. That's, uh, that's how it starts. That's the slippery slope. Yes. No, he's going to get back on it. I, I'm going to, I'm going to ride his ass tomorrow. No. I was moved. Well, there's no chance. Then, then, no, you know, Fraser, you nope, go, good. Hey, hey, good. That's not it's me. True. That's not me. When when somebody tells me I can't do something, right? That's when I, oh, oh I will great. kill well, myself to do it. All right. Well, then then I'm gonna really help support you by telling you that you're gonna fail. There's no chance. <laughs> you're gonna pull this off. I'm gonna show hey. you, Fraser King. Hey, you show me. <laughs> hey, Fraser, hey, you, this is this is a book. Right. Oh, 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 okay. Next time, hey, next time Ooh. we talk, next time you're on this show, I'm going to yeah. be holding up my book. How about I can't that? Wait. I can't wait. Okay, That's fantastic. Fantastic. You know, oh, the so, you know, I have one I of those. Know. So, nice. uh, Fraser, you, you're, uh, you already have a login for NaNoWriMo, right? No, I, I, my day job is being a writer. I'm, I'm not gonna write, oh. write additional. Oh no, no, no! I just thought if you, because if you, if you sign in, every, I encourage everyone sign in, set up an account for NaNoWriMo, sign in, just to bug the shit out of Pete, because he, he's using that. Oh, he yeah. is do it. Yeah. Get me. I'm in it. Right. I'm on yeah. it. Yeah. No, no, no. I, uh, I wouldn't want to take on an additional writing project i yeah. literally have all the no 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 only to only to ride pete's ass that's the only oh, reason you would do it no nope. you know what nobody it might, nobody's nobody is riding my ass it's that, crazy that'll be a goal for next year is to just really adequately harass my friends working on yeah. nanorimo there you go hey yeah. i do know this i know spence is on nanorimo and she's one of my writing buddies so she's she's paired up with me and hey spence i'm behind I'm behind. Uh oh. So well, hold on. So hello? we're twelve days in. How many words have you got in the? Uh, 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 have you got in the in the can right now? Oh shit! Uh, I can look it up real quick. Mike, talk for a second while I look it up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was going to start the outro. If you no. want to find out more from Fraser Kane, I highly <laughs> yes. recommend you go to yes. Universe Today, UniverseToday.com. Also, listen to our podcast. Uh, at astronomycast.com, the uh, long running show. We just crossed our 500 episode mark with me and Dr. Congratu- Pamela Gay. Congratulations um, on that. And then, of course, as you mentioned, I do the Guide to Space, which is the video series. I'm up to my 365th episode, is going to drop in a couple of days, and it's all about Oumuamua, is probably not a solar sail. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the other cool, fun thing that we're doing as well on Twitch, we're hooking up telescopes live of the night sky and showing people uh, what's going on in the night sky right now. I'm sort of like a DJ with a live telescope. So if you want, to- oh, I wish you would have clued that. I would definitely. We've been, yeah, you got it. So if we just go on Twitch and search for your name, then yeah, do search for my name on Twitch. Okay. Uh, and it's it's pretty chill. We used to do these things called the virtual star parties, and I remember those. And we're so we're bringing that back. But way better with a with a really great a, a sort of observatory that we have our hands on that does incredible pictures of the night sky. So right. right now I'm testing it out and I'm I'm sort of getting the whole system rolling. And once I'm there, then then we're going to try and put on a show again. But but a, a but a much better version of what we did before. So uh, definitely stay tuned. Definitely All right. So yeah. I, I got my numbers. I got my fantastic. We and you should do that. Astronomy Cast is a fantastic podcast super awesome if you're not subscribed to it what's wrong with you you should be Um, if you're watching this episode if you You watched all this you need to be there because that's way better than this um all right so so (laughs) i'm at i'm currently at 17 (laughs) 531 and i did my calculator i should be at twenty thousand. so i am about 2500 words behind now I still have today. That's counting today, and I was planning to write after we were done here for a little bit, but that's still yep. behind. I'm not. I'm not going to pump out 2,500 words tonight. But I, you know, so I, I've been writing a little behind for a while. But I'm going to catch up. I am I mean, going to catch up. I mean, how many words are you aiming for? 
50 50k 50k is the is the number 30 days 50k 30 days yep that's pretty rough it is it yep. is he's but, gonna do it but i'm gonna do it i'm determined i'm determined i'm gonna do it i will kill I myself wait. to do it i can't wait to, to watch you fail no <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm. <laughs> I see what you're doing, and I'm, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. All right, Peter, roll That's the right. outro. Roll the outro. You got it, man. Here we go, Mike. Go. You've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits. We are live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Please ask us questions or of our guests, or just banter with other myth 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 fits in um, the chat room. If you missed our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at MythWits.com and Myth, Myth at Facebook on MythWits. And check out MythWits.com. Oh, I got to reverse that. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> if you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, and subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. And make sure to share your favorite episodes with your favorite friends, even the people you don't like. Sh share those too. And uh, help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Join our TSRPN.com for more cool shows. Uh, Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like, share in all the appropriate places. Just don't edit it. And don't try and fly by at 450 miles, million miles an hour. Uh, make sure to check out aetherforge.com for more cool stuff and join our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and tell your friends to tune in. And until next time, Pete? At the end of time, a moment will come when just one man remains. Then the moment will pass. Man will be gone. There will be nothing to show that we were ever here but stardust. <laughs>